Hey, uh, hello and good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Gately. I'm the executive director of BIO. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this evening with Kitty Kelly, who will be in conversation with Heath Hardich Lee. Uh, Biographers International Organization aims to promote the art and craft of biography, cultivate a diverse community of biographers, encourage public interest in biography, and provide educational and fellowship opportunities that support the work of biographers worldwide. Kitty Kelly needs a little introduction, but I will give one anyway. Kitty is the internationally acclaimed author of best selling unauthorized biographies of some of the most celebrated personalities of the last 50 years, including Jackie Kennedy Onassis, Elizabeth Taylor, Frank Sinatra, Nancy Reagan, the British Royals, the Bush family dynasty, and Oprah. Kitty is published in the American Scholar, the Washington Post, the New York Times, and many other outlets. She frequently contributes to the Washington Independent Review of Books. She's received its Lifetime Achievement Award. She's received awards from Penn for her work against censorship. She's debated at Oxford and lectured at Harvard. Kitty Kelly's work stands out for its scrupulous research and investigative reporting, speaking truths to and about the powerful. Her work is the outstanding example of unauthorized biography in our time, maybe all time. For many years as a bio member and a member of the board of directors, Kitty has been a generous supporter of our programs and fellowships, especially the Francis Frank Rollin Fellowship. We are thrilled to recognize her with the 2023 bio award for her contributions to biography as a genre and on a personal level for her warm encouragement of countless biographers. Actually, there is a count of biographers. Now 625 bio members, many of whom have received personal notes from Kitty, who is peerless as our membership director. Incidentally, in case anyone should later be tempted to deny having spoken with Kitty Kelly, these notes may serve as receipts. We very much look forward to presenting the bio award to Kitty in person at our annual conference in New York, which for the last two years has been hosted online. This May, we'll gather again with friends at the Leon Levy Center for Biography at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York for a Biographer's Weekend that is unequaled anywhere in the world. Kitty will give the keynote address on Saturday, May 20th. I'll put the link for the conference and registration in the chat box here on Zoom. Please note the price increase this Saturday, April 1st. This evening, Heath Hardage Lee will join Kitty for a conversation and then invite questions. Heath is an award-winning historian, biographer, and curator who specializes in women's history, and she's served on BIO's board of directors. She's the author of Winnie Davis, Daughter of the Lost Cause, and The League of Wives, The Untold Story of the Women Who Took on the U.S. Government to Bring Their Husbands Home. Heath's biography of First Lady Pat Nixon will be published next year by St. Martin's Press. Heath and Kitty will speak for about 45 minutes, after which there'll be time for questions from the audience. Please type your questions into the chat box. You're welcome to keep your video on, but please keep your audio on mute. We will be recording this event and expect to share the video within the next two weeks. I'm honored now to turn the evening's conversation over to Heath Lee and Kitty Kelly. Thank you so much, Michael. Wonderful introduction and I am so thrilled to be here with one of my personal biographer idols, Kitty. Um, and I want to echo what Michael said about how warm and welcoming Kitty is to all biographers. And just a very short anecdote, when I uh, first came to bio, gosh, many years ago, I think it was eight years ago, Kitty hosted a party at her beautiful house in Georgetown. And I was very nervous to meet her because I am a lifelong fan of hers, attested to by my battered copy of Jackie O, which is like, you know, original, original first printing. And I is my favorite, perhaps, of all her books. But Kitty was so welcoming and warm. And I will never forget just feeling like I belonged at her house. Um, and that was a really nice feeling for someone very new to the profession um, and made me, of course, always enjoy being at bio events after I always felt welcome. But that was largely thanks to um, Kitty and Jamie Morris also. So wanted to just say that. 
And then want to get immediately into the frame of mind to talk about Kitty's legendary career. It is going to be impossible to fit this into the short time we have together. So I'm just going to pick some highlights to talk about, and then we'll see where the conversation leads us. To set the scene, however, I want to give you a quote that I love that is written by Kitty herself from her essay, Unauthorized But Not Untrue, from the American Scholar. And this was sent out earlier um, from Linda Leval, our, our president. I encourage you all to read the entire essay. But here is just a short quote that I think relates to Kitty and her work. Quote, admittedly, biography by its very nature is an invasion of a life, an intimate examination by the biographer her, who burrows deeper and deeper to probe the unknown, reveal the unseen, illuminate the unexpected. I don't, I don't think you can say it better than that. So with that, I want to welcome Kitty officially to our chat today. And I, I only wish we had some glasses of wine. I should have just had it with me. We should, could have done it. Okay. Okay, good. And I'm like, I should have done the same thing. So now I'm regretting that, but we can do it even without alcohol, not a problem. So I'm going to just launch into the questions. The first one I want to ask you is really about the character of ourselves as biographers. What attributes do you think a person should possess to become a really good biographer? Curiosity. Absolute curiosity. Uh, John F. Kennedy said it. The reason that he loved history and he read biography was to answer that single question, what's he like? And I'm fascinated by that. Still am. Yeah, you can see that in your writing. You're just interested in people. That's However, I will tell you, <clears throat> for the longest time, I had trouble with the word unauthorized because it sounded like it was breaking and entering. And people were very, um, they praised the authorized biography. But I found that those, I guess, they were too guarded. They were um, too, they insisted on control too much. Yes. While it would have been nice to have the person's cooperation, I just felt that I would have a better picture without it because I wouldn't give that kind of control. Right. A good point. You make a lot of compromises with authorized biography to, to get things that you need sometimes. So your approach is, I think, has yielded a lot of amazing, amazing insights. Um, you're not, your hands aren't bound by, by things that other people might be. Um, speaking of that, Tell us a little bit about your career trajectory in the first place, because I don't think a lot of people know about your first book and, and maybe don't even know about your time at the Washington Post. So give us a little sort of timeline of how that all happened. Well, I'm old. OK, you don't I have to old. give dates specifically. No, <laughs> no, no. I, I am old other. and that's that. And I'm. I'm grateful for it. I did work at the Washington Post. I was on the editorial page as a researcher. And I guess the thing that really launched me was the day that the um, editor shortly after hiring me walked in and said that he had just read this fabulous piece in the front page of the style section by Myra McPherson. And I give her full credit for starting my career because she had done a piece on Palm Sunday in Washington in the riot torn area. And the editor was just raving about it. And I said, well, I, I was there. I didn't see it that way. He said, what do you mean you were there? I said, well, I was there. And he said, well, what did you see? And I told him what I saw. And he said, write it. And I wrote it and he published it in the Washington Post on the editorial page. And 
that kind of did it for me. I felt that I was blessed as giving an unauthorized view. I stayed at the Washington Post for a couple of years. It was a fabulous job. I loved it. I did the research for the editorial writers. And I thought how wonderful it would be to go on and, and write and research the rest of my life. It was naive, but I did it. Wow. Yeah. And the first, the first book, the first book I did was on health spas in America that sold 14 copies all to my mother. <laughs> and then I did, I really kind of earned my stripes as a biographer. And I'll tell you why. Because the first one I did was on Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. I had immense admiration for this woman and her family. And I read everything that was written. The publisher I had, I'm going to tell you what he paid me to write my first biography. $3,000. Oh, my goodness. I did not have a literary agent. That was a huge mistake. My second book was on Elizabeth Taylor, and I was given access to the legal files at MGM, and I thought, well, this is going to be wonderful because she was the last star of a studio system and so forth. I thought, this is great. You can combine the scholarship and the contemporary life didn't work out that way. <clears throat> I did get a literary agent, I thought. It was a literary agent by the name of Lucy Ann Goldberg. She ended up, and that name might be familiar to some people because she was connected to Monica Lewinsky. And Lucy Ann Goldberg made off with about $80,000 in foreign royalties. <clears throat> and it took a lawsuit. By the time that was over, I thought, no, I've written two biographies. I just, no. But I found a wonderful agent in Lynn Nesbitt. She was fabulous. And she said, Kitty, if you did do it, and I said to her, I'm not going to do another one. This is awful, terrible. And she said, but if you did, who would you do? And I said, well, I'm fascinated by Frank Sinatra. Yeah. And Lynn sold that book. And I, I told you the amount of money I was paid on the first book was $3,000. Lynn Nesbitt called me and she said, Kitty, we have an offer for a million dollars for you to write a book on Frank Sinatra. I, I said... A million dollars. Now, I know we're talking here in 2023, but it still seems like a lot of money to me. That is, yes. And it was a subject that I thought was really worthwhile. It was political. It was entertainment. It was 20th century America. Oh, I thought this is wonderful. So I signed. And I'd like to tell you that that was happily a wrap, but it wasn't. What happened with that book, and I had a fabulous editor. To have an editor at this point on my third book was like a luxury like the advance. She was fabulous. Her name was Jean Bernkopf. She's since gone to the Angels. But she was wonderful to work with. However... Frank Sinatra sued me before I had written a word. And that <clears throat> I called my publisher and I said that I had heard that Frank Sinatra had sued me. And my publisher, Bantam Book, said, well, you're on your own. We don't have a manuscript. And I said, but he sued me for two million dollars and I haven't written anything. Well. Call us when you have a manuscript, they said. So I went to the writers groups that I belong to. And they, they were very funny. They said, now, wait a second. You're coming to us for support. 
you're not asking for money. I said, no, I'll handle the finances. So you haven't written a word so that we can stand up and defend you under the First Amendment. Is that right? I said, yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. And they did. And they shamed the publisher into stepping forward. Anyway, it was a, a real lesson that I learned to be sued before you had written a word and not have your publisher behind you because you hadn't handed in the manuscript. Mm. Okay, finally, three years later, I hand in the manuscript. The publisher says, no, no, we've got to change things here. Um, <clears throat> no, you can't say that Frank Sinatra, uh, you can't say that his mother was an abortionist. I said, but she was in Hoboken. Well, that's all right. You just call her a midwife. And so I found myself not just on that, but on, they wanted to water everything down. They were so afraid of being sued by Frank Sinatra again. I said, why? He's already done it. He kept that lawsuit going, by the way, for one year until he finally dropped it. Mm. Anyway, Heath, go ahead. I, I don't know. That's exactly the Frank is was one of my questions is. So what did you mentally how did you mentally cope with this for that long of a period? Because that is a long time to worry and be anxious. And, and you know, I think he was trying to intimidate you also, as I recall. So, you know, something at the point. I was in New York during research, and at the point my husband called and said, I just want you to know you've got to come home early because the lawyers are coming to Washington and everyone is meeting. They claim they have a tape recording of you calling Frank Sinatra and um, disguising yourself. I said, what? Yeah, anyway, Monday morning, nine o'clock. So all the lawyers showed up at the house and they brought this tape recording. And I, I will tell you, I thought maybe I did it. Maybe. And I said that to my husband, you know, maybe I just snapped my cap in the middle of the night or something. He said, you didn't do it. You're under pressure, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, they brought the tape recording. They put it on the table. And it sounded like Boy George um, with a balloon in his mouth, <laughs> imitating. And you could see the lawyers, even mine. I hired O'Melveny and Myers, and they're going like this. <laughs> and so they thought I'd done it, too. I thought I had done it, too. Um, that's get how right. crazed you get when someone with that kind of power comes after you. Anyway, they knew that the tape was a fake and finally Sinatra agreed to drop his case, but he wanted me to apologize. And by that point, I was like, no, no, no excuse me. Mm -hmm. You sued, you caused us all this, you dropped the case. Right. And after a year, he did. Amazing. That's amazing. But the fortitude you showed there is, is admirable because I, I think that many people would back down very quickly um, on some. But then, you know, I had to fight my publisher because when the manuscript was handed in and it proved that Frank Sinatra lied under oath, that he had done this, that he had done that, he'd been arrested. They were frightened. Yeah. Yeah. I think we see that today with publishers. They can be, you know, it's not, I don't know that it's changed all that much sometimes. So good for you for standing up. But I do want to go back to what you were saying about agents and that bad experience you had. So you had the very bad experience with one agent, but then a really excellent experience with this other agent. 
So in terms, and, and then you had a wonderful editor and that makes such a difference, I think, to everyone. But what advice do you have for biographers in terms of agents and, and the way you use them and figure out if they're a good fit? Oh, well, I think they show you that. I mean, I'd still be with Lynn Nesbitt today, but she left ICM and started her own agency. And she did it at a time when the book the book that I had contracted for was with ICM. And so I stayed with ICM and I stayed with their lawyer, Wayne Kaback, who's been absolutely fabulous. Um, and I don't know, I, I thought Lucianne Goldberg was a one-off. I'm not aware of, of agents who steal from their clients. Uh, that was very hard. That's extreme. Yeah. yeah, that was extreme. In fact, um, it was 17 months of asking her to please send royalties. And she had stolen the money in quite a clever way, because when you have a book that's published in the United States and you sell foreign rights, your foreign rights go through the agent and right. it's 20 percent. So let's say she would call me and say, oh, we just sold your book in Spain. And we sold it for $7,000 when really she'd sold it for $15,000. She kept it. And she did this with about 17 different sales and it told a certain, certain amount of money. I kept asking. And after 17 months, I finally said to her, Lucianne, if you don't give me a credible account, I really am going to sue you. Yeah. I have to. And I did. And we ended up in court, federal court, five days, a five day trial. Mm. And the jury came back, all counts against her, in addition to which they asked for punitives. Great. Which always made me, from that point on, I've always believed in the jury system. <laughs> yeah, right. <I> have. <clears throat> yeah, that's, I mean, and good for you too for keeping those careful accounts. I, I think sometimes. However, I do want to tell you, um, I learned from that. And I learned from Frank Sinatra from, from the lawsuit. And I realized he was doing it to intimidate people so that they wouldn't talk to me. And I found myself doing a lot of, I do to this day, a lot of research before I ever do an interview. And I'm going to show you, well, this is just from the, from doing the Bush book. I don't know if oh. you can see it, but it's about 140 pages of a chronology. And I really advise writers two things. This chronology has saved me so many times, but it's benign facts. Do not make a chronology with any judgments. Just put in uh, 1917, Prescott Bush was born. And just do dates so that by the time you get an interview with someone, no matter who it is, and you carry this document, what you're saying is that I'm serious about my subject. And I know that you um, knew him, know him, but you must have known him at a certain period of time. And then you find what those years are and you show the person and so they can see that you're very, very serious about your subject. Oh, they might say, oh, no, no, no. I, I remember it differently, which is fine. You put that down. The other thing I would say, and this is coming from someone who has been sued but never lost a lawsuit, mm -hmm. write a thank you note to every person you interview. I learned this after Sinatra because I said, when the lawyers brought this phony tape recording, I said to my lawyers, somebody was going to lie under oath. How do I protect myself from that? And the lawyer said, oh, kitty, just tape record everything. 
Well, you can't tape record, at least you couldn't then. States are very different. It's very, very hard to tape record someone in a restaurant or in traffic. Or... So I decided I would write a thank you note to every single person I interviewed. And after interviewing them, I would write and say, oh, dear Heath, Thanks so much for taking the time Tuesday night to talk about biography and how you did it. I didn't have a chance to compliment you on that pretty pink blouse you were wearing with the print and that great collar. I also was entranced by the wallpaper behind you. I hope we can talk again. If I have any questions, I'll be back in touch. Again, my thanks sincerely. And I would then <coughs> send you that and I would keep a copy of it. And I have to tell you, when I wrote the Nancy Reagan book, mm -hmm. the Bush Dynasty book, people stepped forward to deny, I never gave her an interview. She's making it up. And I would produce the thank you note to the legal counsel of Simon and Schuster, and it saved me every single time. That is such a great, great way to deal with it. And, and so it's just so cool and clever. I love it. Well, and since we're speaking about thank you notes and protocol, let's talk about first ladies because you have um, done some work on that. Nancy Reagan, the Bush dynasty. I'm working on Pat Nixon's biography right now. So I am very interested in your take on first ladies and how you get people to talk to you, how you go about that specifically do you or, or do you see them no differently than say a movie star or a political figure well they are a political figure of course right. um i think you go about it the same way you would interview anyone now i will tell you all the subjects i've written about have never <laughs> given me an interview although i have asked I began every single book I wrote by writing to the subject as a matter of courtesy to say who I was and what I was doing and that I hoped that they would give me an interview. And I tried many times, many times, and I would send questions to them and I just got stonewalled at every turn, but that's okay. That doesn't answer your question, though, Heath. Um, Did you go to their staff? But you certainly got people on record that had worked for them and, you know. Other absolutely. You go, to, you go to staff. You go to political appointees. You go to members of the president's staff. Uh, uh, when I wrote Nancy Reagan, I think I had. 800 interviews. Now, this doesn't mean, this means if I had 800 interviews, I probably had 1,600 that said no. Mm -hmm. In fact, it got so scary for me at times um, that on the Frank Sinatra book, people were so frightened that I almost started to get frightened. Mm -hmm. And there were times that a wife might give me an interview and say, never, never tell my husband that I've done this or vice versa. In fact, when I was writing the Royals, I interviewed Lady Elizabeth Longford and she said, you just can't say anything. You can't ever tell anybody that we've had these talks. We met many times. She was charming. But one night I was at an art gallery opening and she was there with her husband and she came running over and her husband, Lord Longford, said, how do you know this outrageous American writer? And she and then she forgot, you know, that she'd sworn me to secrecy. And <laughs> oh, that's great. I like that story. Wow. And the royal. I do believe in the thank you notes. It's not only a matter of courtesy, but it also protects you and protects your publishing. Right. 
Yeah, that's really, obviously it's been really important. So um, that's a very good tip. Well, and then the Royals, we've got to get to that too. So now, since you really were one of the first biographers to really cover the Royals in that way, in this breaking up these icons, you know, humanizing them, I'd love to know what you think now about all the Meghan and Harry stuff going on, the state of royalty now versus writing books about royalty now, for instance, versus when you first started to do it. I mean, yours was really groundbreaking in terms of of covering that family. But it looks a little tame, doesn't it, next to Prince Harry's book? Prince Harry's book, yes, of course. Very interesting. Um, but I, I, you know, yours is groundbreaking, though, because it is one of the first to to do that. And his, you know, written from his perspective. So when I, I say that I do write to the subjects ahead of time to say that I've been under contract to do this book and blah, 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 blah. <clears throat> In the case of the royals, the press secretary, although they don't call themselves that. They have a very highfalutin title at the <clears throat> at Buckingham Palace. This man kept writing me back and saying, now we do things differently here in the United Kingdom. And so we would appreciate your sending all of the questions that you'd like to ask and who you would like to interview and we can proceed from there. And I wrote him back to say, "Mm, don't do it that way. But I would like to know such and such and so and so. And I don't understand this. And could you explain this? So he sent me this 650 page royal encyclopedia to explain titles and, you know, the whole thing of the royal family. There's this huge chandelier and it's called the monarchy. And from there, there are layers and layers and titles and titles. And after almost four years of researching that book, I walked away feeling like a red, white, and blue American. I lost all reverence, I guess, for royalty. Yeah, I really did. And I'm sure that anybody listening to us who has written a biography knows that you you study the subject so carefully that you start taking on some of the characteristics. I mean, after writing about Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis, I dress better. After writing about Elizabeth Taylor, well, I got divorced. <laughs> after you got writing, much jewelry, though. What? You have, you got good jewelry. You have wonderful taste in jewelry. So you must have learned that from Liz Taylor. Right. After Frank Sinatra, I love the color orange. It was his favorite color. And you know something? Interesting. I still love his singing. Yeah. Yep. It's good you can separate that. I think a lot of people wouldn't be able to. Uh, When Jonathan Yardley reviewed my book for the Washington Post on Sinatra, he gave it high praise and said that he could never listen to his music again. I can. (coughs) Wow. Well, so many things to get to. I'm going to just ask a couple more questions and then I want to get to the audience questions because they are piling up as I knew they would. So I want to get to those as many as I can of those as well. Um, I do want to ask you what attracts you to your subjects? Like, what do they have to have? You've given a a little insight about that already, but what does it have to have to make you sign that contract? On the books I've done, I've truly believed that these people had an influence on our society in some way. They are not just celebrities. They are not, they are more than that. They've influenced our lives politically, socially, in so many ways. And they spoke to 
that particular century. I'm mostly 20th century, early 21st century. And I felt that they were a totem of our society and that I have to feel this way because it was three or four years of my life. It was like a college education in these people. So I really did believe in them. Right. So I get a little squiffy if I'm described as a celebrity biopic. Right. Yeah, that's that's reductive. And yeah. yeah I, and I do think what you're saying about the three to four years, it's almost like you're married to the subject for a short time, a short marriage. But, you know, nonetheless, it's such a deep dive. I think you have to have a real intense interest in that subject to be able to. You know something, Heath, we talked earlier about walking in with a chronology when you interview someone. <clears throat> and I recommend this for all writers because it'll help you in writing the book. But when you go in to interview someone and you present them with 150 pages on the life of your subject, they see that you have taken this seriously. It is like a master's thesis. I know it sounds crazy, yeah. but that's what it is. And when they see that you take the subject so seriously, then they take it seriously too and give you about the best interview you can get. Yeah, that's great advice. They know you're serious and they know you've done your homework. Um, which you clearly have. And then along those lines, your research is so intense. You do hundreds and hundreds of interviews. You have these chronologies and fact sheets that you've got everything on them. How do you keep this straight? Like what's your system for keeping all this straight? I, um, I divide the files into three major categories. The first one, names. And so one section of the room is an alphabetical files of names. The second dates, I will have a date for every month and year of the person's life. The next file, and I'm sure that if someone can improve on this, I'd appreciate it. I do subjects. In other words, if you're interviewing someone, uh, the subjects would go <clears throat> NR colon, Nancy Reagan colon, uh, birthday parties, N uh, Nancy Reagan clothes divided into years, philosophers, and uh, absolute alphabetical list of subjects pertaining to the person you're writing about. So I have three different sections, names, dates, and subjects. That was the only way I could think to organize it because I might be writing about the person in 1936 and I could go to the 1936 files and they would mention something else and then I could go to the subject files. Right. And to the, so I keep those three major files, but I am open to refined advice from anybody. <laughs> Everyone has their own systems, you know, and I think you have to do what works for you. That sound, sounds like a very organized system to me. Um, so but in this day and age, he, people are on, I mean, I do, right. I do use a computer, but I don't do my files that way. And I got so um, careful, especially on Frank Sinatra, that I kept dupes, files in one place and files in another place, because wow. I received so many threats that I was worried that I might lose. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, that's biography under duress. I mean, that's a whole other panel discussion. Well, on a lighter note, last two questions, and we'll get to the audience questions. I don't know if you, you feel comfortable saying this, but I'm going to ask, who has been your favorite 
biographical subject to date? It's always the person you write about last. A good it really answer. is. Um, always. Yeah. Because after each one, you think, oh, please, God, I'm not going to do this again. I don't <laughs> care. I don't care what they offer. I'm saying no. Mm -mm. And so the fact that you've survived the next one seems to be the favorite. Now, my husband said that of all the books I've written, his favorite was the Sinatra book. Mm. But I think that had to do with the male connection. Right. That makes sense. Yeah, it would be hard to pick just one um, for sure because you've written so many fantastic ones. My least favorite, I will tell you, was Elizabeth Taylor. Oh, really? Okay, it, why was that the couldn't least? Couldn't stand it. I mean, huh. was any time I have to write about my biographies, what I've written, you'll notice that maybe on the very last paragraph, I might fess up to having done it. I guess because I started out writing that book thinking I was really going to be doing a big biography about the studio system in Hollywood. And she was the last star of a studio system that was disappearing. But Instead, I got overwhelmed with husbands and divorces and jewelry stores and <laughs> hospitalizations. What and a life. Yeah. It took over the kind of, uh, I guess, inflated view I had starting out. Interesting. Yeah, I could see that. She's a, that's a lot to cover for sure. Well, and last question, is there anyone out there that you would consider doing a biography of currently? Anyone that's really interesting to you if you were going to do another one? Right this minute, I would say no. And please do not even suggest Donald Trump. Please don't. <laughs> I know better than that. No. Okay. <laughs> well you never know someone might come up you can't resist so well oh, I would love that <laughs> well let me get to the chat because we have so many questions here so let me go to the chat and I'm going to go back to the first question which is from Debbie Applegate oh, Debbie, Debbie. Who has wonderful questions? Well, well, you answered it basically already. Uh, you know, you you uh, you insisted on getting tough, and he backed down essentially. I mean, it was you getting tough. It seemed to me. Am I correct, or do you have other speculations about why he backed off? I didn't see the question. I'm sorry. So the question: Do you, Debbie? Do you want to ask it? I just uh, I I got excited and you were already on your way to answering the question. I was too over eager hang, ha, raising my hand too soon, uh, which was really speculating on his tactics. Obviously, he thought he could intimidate you, and then it sounds to me like turns out he couldn't, and that that and like a bully, he backed off in that 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 dynamic. Am I correct, or is there something else going on there? Your question is dealing with Frank Sinatra and the lawsuit, right? I think he saw that he just couldn't, he just couldn't win. And there was not a case there. He didn't have the evidence that he was putting forward. But he did teach me a lesson, which was to be careful and to make sure that Absolutely, everything I had, everything I said was documented. He did teach me a lesson there. There is a, a follow-up question on Sinatra from Gail Feldman. Was it the lawyers at Bantam who were frightened about the Sinatra situation? The lawyers were frightened. I was not frightened. Uh, 
the lawyers and the editors at Bantam really at one point <clears throat> they said you have to do this and you have to you cannot you cannot call describe his mother as an abortionist you have to describe her as a midwife and i said well i did describe her as a midwife but she also performed abortions well you can't say that oh well i had this wonderful source who received an abortion from Mrs. Sinatra. She ran a, a mill out of her house on Garden Street in Hoboken. No, no, you can't say that. And we got into this back and forth until finally the publisher said, you know, we're not going to publish this book the way you've written it. And I said, fabulous, this is wonderful. I'll take it elsewhere. And they said, no, no, you can't do that. We paid you. They didn't pay the whole million up front, but we have given you a million. I said, that's fine. You know, I started out very proud of myself for getting a million dollar advance. Two years later, I didn't care about that million dollars. I was ready to walk because I had done so much work on the book and I believed in it so much. And it was so nailed down that I didn't want to water the way they did. So I said, no, I'll leave. No, 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 no. They said at that point, but they, they hired outside counsel and the inside counsel and the outside counsel for the next 365 days. I mean this every day called me with a legal question. And that includes Christmas day, the phone rings. We just want to check. Do you have documentation on this footnote that you're insisting we use? I did insist on having chapter notes in that book. I realized the first two biographies I wrote, I didn't have chapter notes. I didn't know that that was important. And I did know it was important by the time I wrote the Frank Sinatra book. I insisted on the chapter notes. The publisher didn't want chapter notes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, that was a long way of answering the question. That's a good point on the chapter notes, because I still think, you know, they, they're like, oh, we don't want to Print all these, but they're so important that that is your documentation to show you did your homework and, and your coverage. So it's great you insisted on that. That's really important. Um, an another question related to Frank um, from Stacy Schiff on what and on what grounds did he initially sue without the manuscript even in the picture? Oh, Stacy, it's such a great question. Um, he sued me in Los Angeles under a used car salesman statute that was so bizarre and locally uh, pivoted that, that none of us could wrap ourselves around it. It was a used car salesman statute. And that's why I had to hire brilliant on Sinatra's lawyer's part, forcing me to hire Los Angeles lawyers to represent me. And that ridiculous premise cost in legal fees for me over $100,000 until Frank Sinatra dropped that lawsuit. Mm. Goodness. Ugh. All right, so Lisa Cardin, what was your initial experience with O, is it O Milvaney like? Did you continue to use the same firm and or attorney after the Sinatra litigation? O Melvaney and Myers, they were fabulous. They were absolutely wonderful. I, um, I felt I had good representation. Um, uh, even, when, even when the senior partner said, oh, Kitty, just tape record everything. And 
it forced me to realize that you can't tape record everything. In fact, at one point when I got an interview with Frank Sinatra's former valet who had been with him for years, he met me and he said, I'll meet you in Dan Tanis, a bar in Santa Monica. And at that point, I called a friend of mine who was in Los Angeles at the time. And I said, Stanley, will you please come to this bar and sit a couple seats away from me because I'm gonna be meeting and interviewing Frank Sinatra's former valet. And um, it's going to be hard to tape record him in a bar. And so Stanley did. And I brought out my tape recorder. The valet said, no, no tapes. Okay. So I took notes. And at one point I had walked in, it was a late afternoon interview and I had the Los Angeles examiner in my hand and he was telling me how he used to sign Frank Sinatra's name. And I gave him the paper and said, show me how you show me his signature because I know his signature. And he did it, he did it perfectly. And I kept that paper. And I also had Stanley as a witness to that interview when he tried to deny it. Oh. Oh, I love that. Long way of saying that you become a bit paranoid in protecting yourself. Right. Maybe not so paranoid. Um, that was smart. All right. Lori Shapiro has a question. This, this is a, a great question. Something I would like to know as well. If you have someone who early on said no to an interview, do you give them a second chance towards the end of the book and say, I'm going to print? Or do you say try once and it's done? Oh, no. I try over and over and over. I can't tell you. Lord. I um, When I did Jackie O, I very much wanted to interview Senator George Smathers, who had been JFK's best friend. He'd been a groomsman in the wedding. And he turned me down nine times and the, his secretary, he was then a lawyer in Washington, he retired from the Senate and his secretary felt so sorry for me. I was so pathetic. She said, he doesn't want to talk. He's never talked about Kennedy. What question do you have? Just one question. And I said, I'd like to ask him about the 1956 vice presidential race when Kennedy didn't get, he wasn't on the ticket and he went to the South of France with George Smathers and Jackie was pregnant at the time. I just want, that's my only question. She said, all right. She set up the interview finally, after nine times letters and phone calls, George Smathers gave me an interview and the secretary said, do you want it over lunch? Or do you want it at the end of the day? And that became the hardest question of my day, which was, do you go, do you go to lunch with the guy and take notes? Or do you do it at the end of the day when he's tired and might be cranky? I did finally I said, I'll, I'll do the end of the day. I went into his office at five o'clock. I didn't get home until eight. 30 that evening. And at one point, Senator Smather said, you know, <clears throat> Jack was really something. Senator Smathers was from Florida and he had a bit of a Southern accent. He said, I love the guy, but you know, he just was a lousy lover. Really, he'd get, he's like a rooster. He'd get on top of her, just getting on top of a hen real fast and fluffing her feathers. <laughs> I was so taken aback that I said, excuse me, Senator, but with all due respect, how, how can you say something like that unless you were in the room with him? Well, of course I was in the room with him. Jack loved doing it, having people around. After that, I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> and when the book came out, and Senator Smathers was quoted at length 
on the colorful things he said, a reporter from the Washington Post called him fully expecting that he would deny it. And Senator Smathers admitted everything he said. And he said, I guess I was just run over by a dumb looking blonde. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm the question, but. Wow. That is such a great story. Like what was going on in his mind? Like he must have had some complex about Jack Kennedy, don't you think? Maybe no, I think he really I think he really loved him and I think that you know it had been by the time I interviewed Senator Smathers, it had been about 14 years since the president had died and I wonder if anybody had really asked Smathers. I mean, he was really going back in his memory. Mm -hmm. These two men who were married and in the United States Senate rented a house together simply to entertain other women. Uh, yeah. It was quite extraordinary for its time. And it was also extraordinary for Smathers to speak so openly. And I'm very grateful that he told the truth because it would have been very easy for him to say, I never said those things. Right. Right. Mm. Love that story. All right. New question. Felicity Yost, has anyone come to you and asked you to write their biography? <laughs> <laughs> You know, right. that would be the best way to put me out of business. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll move on. So James Work Workinger, to, um, will your papers and recordings someday be deposited somewhere where future researchers and the public will have access? I wish. I wish I've kept them. I don't know who would um ever be interested but as you can see from these 100 page chronologies i do have immense files and i've kept them in storage and they would be i don't know a treasure to someone maybe just people like us <laughs> yes Yes. I mean, they would be. I, yeah, I think we need to start the bidding. I mean, you could definitely, those, this need to go somewhere where they can be used. So maybe we'll all think about that. All right. We don't have too much time left, but I'm going to try to do a few more questions. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. We, and we, we did kind of did this one before. Hi, Kitty. Which person did you most enjoy writing about? A little, uh, kind it's of a talk. great question, though. I really, I, um, I loved writing about all of them, as agonizing as I can carry on about doing it. I did enjoy it because it was history. It was contemporary history. Um, I enjoyed writing about the Kennedys. I enjoyed the Elizabeth Taylor. Mm, yeah. Frank Sinatra was fascinating. It took me into worlds that I didn't expect to travel in. Um, interestingly enough, the death threats that I got were not so much on the Sinatra book, it showed me later, real power was in the politics. It was on the Reagan book that I got death threats, oh. on the Bush book. And that, the Frank Sinatra book, that's mafia, that's business. But the political books were the ones that became scary in retrospect. But I really, I enjoyed doing each one of them because broadened my horizons. And for that, I'm very grateful. 
let, let me interject. How long do most books take you like a Bush book or the written Nancy Reagan book? How many years do you spend on that? Three to four years. Now, I will tell you this. There are going to be people that are gagged to hear this, but this is before the internet. So I would spend days, weeks at the Library of Congress going through the card catalog. I would try and read everything I could before I ventured out on an interview because I wanted to know as much as possible. Now, most professional journalists will tell you that they leave their toughest questions for the very end. I start out that way because I'm afraid they're going to throw me out in the first 10 minutes. So I start out, you know, hi, Heath, it's so nice to meet you. How come you killed your husband? Did you do it with a knife or did you do it with a gun? Right. And I try, I learn never to be judgmental. I'd be like this. Oh, you did? You killed. Was it a gun? I was probably more efficient with a gun. Oh, you strangled him, really? Well, now how? Oh my goodness! That's <laughs> smart, though. You know, you got to get it in fast. Like you, you never know if you'll be invited back. So, like, that's a good idea. <laughs> I think we all feel that way. I know I have my layers of questions just like that. So it's good advice. So if you're holding on to the worst question until the end, go ahead. I'm here for you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Uh, all right, let's see. What if one of your subjects would have said yes to an interview? Would their would their cooperation have changed your research and writing process? Interesting. That's such a good question because if the subject had said yes, now remember, I I'm writing about these inflated, huge, larger than life people. If they had said yes, with no boundaries, that would have been fabulous. It would have been wonderful. I would have loved it. But I have to tell you, I'd also love to be five, seven. <laughs> Not going to happen. Yeah. There's always restrictions. So I think you're right. Maybe we have time for, or let's do, I think we actually do have time to finish up. Oh, good question for, from Debbie. So maybe no more biographies, but please report on the rumors of an autobiography. Oh, <laughs> an autobiography. Oh my. No, I don't think so. No. A memoir, maybe, but no. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's good to know. Yes, I, I like that question. We'd lo all love to read it. It would be fabulous. And a memoir would be fabulous. So, all right. I think that is everything. Let me make sure. I have not missed one. Oh, wait, I did miss miss one. This is, is a good question. Okay. Have you ever used researchers before? Or do you mm. do all of it yourself? Indeed, I have. I absolutely, I had two fabulous full-time researchers. Um, and they were great. Both of them. One was with me for 12 years, and the other one was with me for about 14 years. So they were really employees. And I, I used them. I learned how to organize, to send them, please get this, please get that, see that you do this. And both of them were terrific. Now, if there's anything more specific on that, um, I certainly will answer it. But in that sense, I have, and I also had a fabulous researcher, a reporter, a journalist. She used to work for the Los Angeles Times, Pamela Warwick. And she 
went to interview the Reverend Don Muma for me when I wrote the Reagan book. She was fabulous. So yes, I have, I've had very good luck with researchers. Yeah, I think we can all use a little legwork help. It's a lot. I did see I missed one other question. I think this is the last one. Um, I have found that with my subject, health and finances were somewhat touchy subjects. Do you find similar categories for each subject you write about? Oh, yes. <clears throat> You're right. You're so right. Health and finances. <clears throat> Family secrets. Mm. Very, very touchy. I don't know if the person asking this question is writing about someone who's alive um, or someone who's deceased, but I found myself uh, doing an awful lot of research in those areas, in the public areas that you could get. And especially when you're interviewing family, it's very tough because Sometimes family don't, they don't want to admit things that appear shameful. So it's, it's difficult. I don't know quite how to answer that question. If you can be a little bit more specific, I'll try and help you. Yes, and I see that... Um... <coughs> Edward O'Shea. Edward, do you have anything you want to add to that? No, but uh, these categories are, were very true for me in, in a book I just finished called Seamus Heaney's American Odyssey. And, uh, you know, there's a certain reticence that comes with being English and Irish, it seems to me, right? And I'm Irish myself uh, by, you know, uh, descendancy. But and so I find those same secrets, I suppose, in my own life. And uh, some of that, uh, my reservations were self-imposed about health because I thought there were a few things that I didn't want to write about. But finances was definitely something I was discouraged uh, from probing. And I had some interesting facts that I probably never did share in my book. That's so interesting because money, finances, defines us so much in this society. So. <clears throat> It's difficult for a lot of people to talk about money and health too, because you don't want to admit your vulnerabilities or your frailties because you'll be judged on them. Uh, so it's very hard to work yourself around. I understand that. All right. I promise this is the last one. I saw one last one pop up and we'll wrap it up from Abby Santa Maria. Kitty, tell us about being a young female biographer and an attractive one. Sexual harassment. You certainly had different challenges to navigate than your, your male counterparts. How did your age and gender sculpt your early <laughs> career? I want to know, please. I'm so, I'm, <clears throat> Abby. Good question. When I was interviewing on the Frank Sinatra book, I got it. I wanted to interview one of the former FBI agents who'd been assigned to tail him. And I finally found the FBI agent and he agreed to meet me at a certain time in New York. And he said he'd be standing in front of the library and he would be wearing a black raincoat and so forth and so on. And so <clears throat> I came up, I saw this man standing there and I, <laughs> deep down I was terrified, but I walked up to him and I said, <clears throat> Ralph, I think his name was Ralph Salerno. He looked at me and he went, you're, you're the one everyone's afraid of? I said, may I see your identification? He said, come on. And so I turned around to walk away. 
He went, whoa, whoa, hold on. What do you want, driver's license? I said, no, I want to see your FBI identification. That was the first thing. So a few months later, I'm in Las Vegas and I had found a fabulous source. She was the <clears throat> mistress, the longtime mistress of mob boss, Mo Dalitz. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, oh, this is wonderful. So I met her and we're sitting there talking and we've been talking for about an hour and a half. And this man came over and he went, seriously? You're the broad that, right? Are you serious? What you? And Barbara turned to, and she said, Mo, sit down. And he sat down and he said, I said, you're Mo Dalitz? And he went, and you're Kitty Kelly. And I thought, no one's going to believe this. No one's going to believe that this is. And I said, how do I get people to talk to me? And he said, you have to just keep asking and asking. And he said, besides, you look so stupid. Anyone will talk to you. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So, mm. yes, it was an insult. But it was true. Hmm. You do look stupid. No, definitely <laughs> not true. Well, that is, all of this is fascinating. It's such a glimpse into this world that we're all lucky to get to hear these stories. And they're so helpful to all of us. We cannot thank you enough. This whole conversation has been amazing, enlightening, scandalous in a delicious way. So it has just been wonderful. So thank you so much for spending this time with us and going over. Thank you all for these wonderful questions. They were great. And um, everyone is looking forward to New York and your big award and celebrating you in May. So thank you. And thank you, Michael, for running all of this and coordinating us. All right, everyone have a good evening. Thank you, Gilly, very much. Thank you, Gilly.